Hello, family. How are you? Does the light slowly rise? It just always is a little eerie. I never know exactly what I'm going to see when it's always a surprise. Glad you guys are here. Thanks. It'd be lonely if you weren't. A um, couple quick things. First of all, I've had a number of people ask me about my cough. Have you guys noticed over the last two months that I've been coughing a lot? Q cough. Um, let me tell you what's happening. Um, Fourth of July weekend, my wife had COVID, and um, I think I'm, I'm convinced that I also had COVID. I just didn't get real sick um, because since that time, we both have been coughing, and I, I hate it. I can't stop it. So. Um, you guys, if you think about it, pray for me with this cough, because it's annoying. It's annoying. It just takes, I've heard people say it took them three months to get over it. So I'm, I'm okay. Um, I've had people be like, you need to go to the doctor. You have a tumor. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, fatalist. Um, it's not that, uh, just COVID. Um, so I think we're just trying to wait the cough out. But anyway, that's what's happening. So I apologize for that, I know it's a nuisance. It's a nuisance for me too. Um, been working on sermons for next year. Thought I would whet your appetite. Uh, the cornerstone of next year's sermon series, um, against my better judgment, we're going to go through Revelation. <laughs> I'm just going to say this right now. Here, here's why. Every generation thinks that Revelation is about them, right? Uh, so I just want to kind of put it to bed, um, and we'll talk about it. Um, one caveat, you do not have permission to leave the church when we do Revelation. <laughs> That's going to be next year. It's coming. Uh, we're going to jump into Psalm 125, and hope you guys read it this morning as you were getting ready, preparing your soul for church. Um, we, <coughs> we were talking about hardships and difficulties and suffering, and now we're moving into the section on the Lord's deliverance, and each one of these is uh, a space that are important for us in preparation for church because when we come to church, we have a community of people who um, there's a percentage of people in both places. Some people are really having a hard time and some people are in a really, really good spot. Some people are celebrating the Lord. And I think when, <coughs> when we're in a good spot, a, a place of plenty, a place of ease, it's important for us to develop the practice of gratitude in that space because in developing gratitude in those spaces of easy times and when we step into uh, hard circumstances we still have gratitude i can tell you that probably the number one thing that has helped me to improve my own leadership is gratitude just simply gratitude like it, it just has it has so many applications. And so uh, this, we're going to start moving into this section over the next few weeks on um, making sure that we're developing this space of gratitude in our own hearts. Psalm 125, here's what it says. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forevermore. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous. That's a significant statement, by the way. The scepter of the wicked shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous. 
And I don't think that's a physical piece of property. I think there's a metaphor there. We'll talk about it. Lest the righteous stretch out their hands to do wrong. What happens is when we have wicked leaders, it starts to take the, uh, it's like the, pet, the verse that says bad company corrupts good character. Um, when, we're, when we're led by wicked people, we start to compromise our own convictions about things little by little by little. Do good, O Lord, to those who are good and to those who are upright in their hearts. But those who turn aside their crooked ways, the Lord will lead away with evildoers. Peace be upon Israel. Which is a weird statement to close that with. If you're good, God, please do good to the good. If they're bad, God, whoop them. Peace. <laughs> <laughs> It's just a weird statement, right? Um, let's look at some lessons that I think are particularly important here. The first one is, I, I want to wrestle with this question, what does it mean to trust in God? What does it mean to trust in God? Trust in God. Well, we, I think if for all of us, we would, like, at least we're sitting in this room, we have some awareness of God. Right? We're probably all at different spaces in our journey, and that's great. But we all have some awareness of God and, and the Bible and Jesus and this whole thing that we're trying to do here. We have varying deg degrees of awareness, but it all is rooted in this trust of this creator of the universe who wants to get to know us and have relationship with us. Um, and, it, and it becomes something that we're like, yeah, I trust in God. But then when circumstances hit, it, it exposes exactly what we trust in. Right? Like, you can call yourself a Christian. You can put whatever label on yourself that you want. But when things happen, it exposes exactly what we believe and what we don't believe. Like, your life will tell you. And that's not for other people to examine you. That's for us to look in the mirror and go, where am I really at? And I think what most people do is we try to live in a deception that we're further along than we are. Like we don't want to be honest with ourselves. What does it mean to trust in God? There is a, a There's a, a thought in Jewish, sorry, I'm distracted in my own mind. Welcome to the world of attention deficit. Um, whew, focus, A.A. A. Ron. <laughs> There's a thought in Jewish thinking. Um, when, when, when you ask a, a Jewish person, how are you doing? They don't say, how are you doing? They say, how's your walk? Because the idea is that when you're born, God creates a path for you to walk, and the goal is to walk it. So the, the path is called derek, and the, to walk it is to halak. So we want to halak the derek. Um, and, and this is fundamentally, like for them, everything is action oriented. So for us as a Western thinkers, we're ab we abstract everything. It's all, we're, we're a noun driven language. They're a verb driven language. So for us, we're like, how are you doing? And we're talking about feelings and thoughts and philosophies. And, oh. For them, it's like, how are you walking? How is, how is your walk? Which is why Paul says in the New Testament, anyone who claims to be in Christ must walk as Jesus walked. And a lot of versions retranslate that as live as Jesus lived. And you can get the idea, but what we do with, in the Western world is we abstract it. We don't just let it be what it is. We abstract it and try to make it something that we would understand. Um, this idea is critical that we are walking the path. Okay? Proverbs 3 one to eight, it says this. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace, they will add to you. So if we follow the teachings of Scripture, length of days and years of life and peace 
They will add to you. So following the teachings of of the scriptures actually should give us peace. One of the measuring rods that you and I can look, look at as we stare at ourselves in the mirror and we try to get honest with our own internal world is as I start to execute on what I believe, does it bring me peace? Furthermore, does it bring peace to other people? Because that's one of the results of following the teachings of scriptures, peace. By the way, peace isn't the absence of conflict. Peace is an internal state of being that's not dependent on my circumstances. And that's important for us to know because you start trying to walk out, like seriously walk out your, your um, beliefs about the Bible, there's going to be some pushback. Somewhere, there's going to be some pushback. More and more as we start to live in a post-Christian culture. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart so that you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. So how, how do we find favor in, in the sight of God and man? We start to work towards putting these scriptures in our own heart. Because here's the deal. It doesn't matter what book you carry or what label you put on yourself. You make decisions by the book that is in you. So the goal would not be to carry a Bible and to know I have access to it. The goal would be to know it, to get it in my soul so that I can actually leverage it to make good decisions in this world. Then I have peace and I have Good success and favor in the sight of God and man. Like, I I had somebody ask me this one time, why would I need to memorize the scriptures? It's all, it's everywhere. I have so many Bibles in my, like, why would I need to memorize the scriptures? Here's why. Because the memorized scripture is what helps you make decisions. Not the book you carry. If you carry a Bible but you don't know what it says, you might as well be carrying a Harlequin romance novel. It doesn't change what you actually do to make decisions. And I know that the next question is, but why do I have to do this so hard? I can't memorize things. I don't memorize good. Um, Not true. Because if we started running down your phone number, your address, your spouse's name. (laughs) Bet you memorized that one. (laughs) Your kids' names. You memorize what's important to you. You hold on to what matters to you. So the problem isn't that you can't remember, it's a priority issue. Now, that's not trying to beat anybody up. It's just true, and and if we're not honest about it, then we don't go, gosh, maybe I need to rethink my priorities. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. So how's your walking? You want to walk the path? You want to walk the path well? You want to have an easy path to walk, a straight path, one that's simple to understand? Then don't lean on your own understanding. This is what happens, and it, I've even had this conversation with my own kids, and it's, it's pretty normal, but people are like, yeah, I know that the Bible says this, but like, it feels like it's so archaic. Like, I, I feel like it, like it doesn't really understand the world we live in today. Yeah, God wasn't thinking clearly when he was God and knew everything, past, present, and future. Like, we don't, it's, it's, well, it's such an old book, like it's so old customs, blah, blah. Like, don't trust in your own understanding. You don't have a better way to understand how the world is supposed to function. God created it. He He made it to function a certain kind of way, and then he wrote this gargantuan user's manual for the world. Tons of words, no pictures. It's amazing. 
all these ideas about how the world is actually supposed to function. And, and when we live consistent with God's ways, not just God's rules, but God's ways, does that make sense? It's not just doing what God tells you to do, it's doing it how God tells you to do it. Because what we do is we start keeping the rules, but we do it with a spirit of anger, we do it with the spirit of angst, with the spirit of judgment, and that's a problem because that's just as much of a violation as not obeying the rules at all. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he'll make straight your paths. If you do that, he'll make your path straight. Be not wise in your own eyes. In other words, I know God says this, but I think this is better. Have you ever had that conversation with somebody? Like, really? You are, like, if you're smarter than God... That's pretty brilliant. That's pretty brilliant. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. There, there's just this reality about walking the Lord's path. That when we do, we, it, I had this, um, for those of you that were at the uh, Infusion Bible Conference, one of the teachers there is um, Randy Smith, who, Randy Smith is maybe the most biblically literate human I've ever met. Like, it is ridiculous. Nora, so we had a dinner with the IBC team uh, the night before the conference, and so I got to come in and hang out with them, which they're, they're wonderful people. Every single one of them, top to bottom, are just the real deal. Um, and Nora put together this trivia game, this Bible trivia game, to try to stump the IBC teachers. I was like, oh, this is going to be fun. <laughs> one of her questions was, who wrote the most words in the Bible and how many words did they write? I was like, why would you even know that information? Randy was like, oh, it was Moses. It was like 125,000 or something. She's like, um, correct. It was 125,379 to be specific. I was like, Randy, how do you know that? He's like, I don't know, I read it somewhere. Somebody wrote it down and I remembered it. Um, that's Randy. And one of the things <laughs> that he said to me that was really fascinating is he, was, he said, if you consider the life of Solomon, like what happens with Solomon is he continues, he starts off really well and he's the smartest guy who ever lived, but then he kind of slowly, slowly, slowly walks away from the Lord and at the end of his life, he's like... <laughs> Walk, not walking with the Lord degrades your intelligence. It just does. Walking with the Lord, staying on God's path, it's healing for your flesh and refreshment to your bones. It gives us a sharpness of life that we otherwise wouldn't have. Now, there's some practical reasons for that. This physically, like, if you're going to really walk with the Lord, you're not going to be an addict, right? So you're going to be careful about how much you drink. You're probably not going to take drugs. Because we all know, um, I started taking drugs, and then everything worked out fantastic, <laughs> is not a story that exists in the world, Right? When you start with drugs, there's one direction for that to go. Why? Because acts that lead to life lead to life, and acts that lead to death lead to death. That's just the way it is. That won't change because you don't acknowledge. But um, so you're good. there's some practical reasons for that that we age better because we're healthier. We don't do a lot of the destructive things physically. But beyond that, I think there's a spiritual reality to that that we stay sharp spiritually. And that God blesses that. Which, by the way, the commandment, you know, honor your father and mother, Paul says in the New Testament, he says this is the first commandment with a promise. 
Because what he says is, honor your father and mother that your days may be long on this earth. Like there's a blessing that comes. That, and it's not just being old. It's not just a quantity of life, but it's a quality of that life. Like this is one of the things that happens. Now, as soon as I say something like that, people are going to be like, well, what about disease and what about da 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 Listen, I, that happens. We live in a fallen world. But I'm just telling you, generally speaking, this is a promise of Scripture. Here's the thing about following God. There's a difference between... The, if you walk with God, there's going to come multiple points in your life where you're going to go, God, what is happening? I don't understand this. I'm walking with you, and it was supposed to go a certain direction, and it did not. Okay? How many of you who have been walking with Jesus for a while have ever hit that space? Like, God, what the heck is going on? Yeah. We all do. We hit it. I have. It's real fun when you're in that space and you've got to preach a sermon. Um, like I don't even know if I believe what I'm saying right now, but <laughs> I'm going to say it because um, it's in the Scriptures, and hopefully I can resolve my own dichotomy. Like, there's, like we're living in this real spiritual experience, right, where things, some things go according to our understanding and some things really don't. And so we question God. Here's the thing. It is normal and should, you should do this, okay, to question what God does. It's okay to do that. When I say you should do that, that doesn't mean every time God does something, be skeptical of it. I'm just saying there's going to come times where God does something in your life and you're like, God, I don't understand that. What the heck is going on? Here's the thing. God's not scared of your questions and it's not irreverent to question God's actions, it's a whole different thing, though, to question who he is. It's one thing to question what he does. It's a whole separate thing to question who he is. Well, God, you don't love me. You let this happen, so that means you don't love me. That's a different category. Are you with me on that? It's normal to question what God does. Because he knows things that you and I don't know, and so he does things that you and I wouldn't do. By the way, he has the power to do things that you and I can't do. And so it's normal to question that. It's a whole other category, however, to question whether or not God's character stands true. Like, God, I don't know if you love me anymore. Listen, he settled that one. If you don't, if you don't know if God loves you or not, like, read John 14 to the end of the book. Like, God settled his love for you on the cross. There's no negotiating that one. But we start to question. So I want to wrestle with this in light of this statement, uh, does God do good to those who are good? There's this in the Psalms, like, do good, O Lord, to those who are good and to those who are upright in their hearts. Like, do good to them. Do good to those who are good. This is a fundamental, by the way, um, uh, there's a teaching in rabbinic, uh, in the first century in rabbinic world of, that says this, God is good to those who are good and he's bad to those who are bad. That's why in John 9, when they see the guy that was blind, the disciples ask Jesus, who sinned that this man was born blind, him or his parents? Because this is their thinking. God's good to those who are good, and he's bad to those who are bad. So if something bad has happened to you, that means that you did something bad or somebody did something bad for this to happen. And what Jesus says is, neither. This man was born blind so that the glory of God could be revealed in him. And sometimes bad things happen so that the glory of God can be revealed in you. And that's actually an act of love. In Judges 14... There's this really interesting story of Samson, uh, the judge. And, you know, it's easy for us to critique Samson. He's in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews 11, and I'm not. Um, so it's really easy for us to stand in the position of critic of Samson. 
But this, this teaching of good to good, bad to bad, uh, it's called um, midah, keneged midah. What it means is measure corresponding to measure. Measure for measure. It works this way. Judges 14, Samson uh, went down to Timnah, and at Timnah, he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. He saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. And then he came up and told his father and mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. And by the way, is it a good idea or a bad idea to marry a Philistine? That's going to be a bad idea. It's going to be a bad idea. But his father and mother said to him, is there not a woman among our daughters or your, of your relatives or among all our people that you must go take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. Now, think about this for a second. When you, when you wrestle with, like, what does Samson struggle with? Like, what is Samson's problem? For a lot of people, they'll go, well, Samson's always alone. Like, he doesn't have a friend to hold him accountable, and so he keeps making these silly decisions. True. But what you read in the scripture is every time he's going to make a bad decision, what it says is, and he saw. And he saw, and he saw, and he saw. Every time he violates his covenant, it begins with, and he saw. What does Samson lose? His eyes. Keneged, midah, keneged, midah. Measure corresponding to measure. Once he loses his eyes, he finally fulfills his purpose. Samson had this great strength and power and, and sway and force of character to, to extract vengeance on the Philistines, but it wasn't until he was broken before the Lord that he was actually useful. Right? Jesus plays on this in Matthew chapter 5 when he says, You've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Boy, if there was ever a time to understand that context matters, <laughs> exclamation point. Don't go extracting body parts. That's not what he's saying. Here's the thing. Does your hand actually cause you to sin? The answer to that is no. Sin is a condition of the heart. Are you with me? The problem isn't the stealing or the lust or the looking. The problem isn't that. The problem is I have a condition in my heart that's broken. But this is a throwback to Samson. It's a reminder that when <laughs> you have things that get between you and the Lord, God will lovingly remove them so that you can be useful to him. Because he loves you too much to let you settle for second-rate blessings. So that we have to wrestle like this measure corresponding to measure. God's not interested in suffering for the sake of suffering. He wants you to become what he's intended you to be, and sometimes suffering is the only way to get there. So we have this, what does it mean to trust God? Well, it means we're going to walk the path. We're going to take him at his word. We're going to actually do what his word says for us to do. <laughs> What does this statement do good to those who are good? This is part of the Jewish thinking around measure corresponding to measure. But we've got to make sure that we're dealing with the heart. Third lesson. <coughs> the wicked cannot rule the land allotted to the righteous. Let's talk about that. Because it feels like on the surface... That's exactly where we're at, right, in a lot of ways. It feels like that. The wicked cannot rule the land allotted to the righteous. Let's go back to that John 9 passage. 
as he passed, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> sorry, it's the Rona. Um, as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned that this man, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Now, before we get to any important points, I want to just pause right there and wrestle with the question, how much spit? <laughs> this is important. These are the things that keep me up at night. Do you got to spit on the ground to make enough mud to cover someone's eyes? That's a lot of spit. And like, what did he? <laughs> and when it happened, were people like, oh my word, that's a lot of spit. <laughs> I, there are certain scenes when I get to heaven that I want to see from the Bible. This one is one of them. When Jesus is at Nazareth and they go to throw him off the cliff and it says he just turns around and walks through the crowd. Like, that's another one. Like, what? The, what? <laughs> How does that happen? Like, I am not the Savior you're looking for. Like, the, <laughs> it just moves on. I don't know. Another one is when the whale yaks Jonah up. I want to see that one. Like, it's a fish that's big enough for him to stay alive in the stomach three days, but it says it yaks him up onto the shore. Now, there's a slope to the shore so this great big fish can't just hop right up to the shore, it would get stranded. So how far back is it and how far does he? <laughs> now you're gonna wanna go back and read Jonah again, aren't you? Like that's, these are the questions. How much spit? And then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam. Now here's the bummer. They're on the Temple Mount, and, and there's a pool really close called the Pool of Bethesda. It's just like a block and a half away. It's not far. Pool of Bethesda is there. And he sends him all the way down to the Pool of Siloam, which is in the bottom of the Kidron Valley. Like that's a, it's not a huge jaunt, but it's a jaunt compared to the Pool of, pool of Bethesda. He's got mud on his eyes. So they go to the pool of Siloam. So why doesn't he just send him to the close pool? Why does he make him go all the way down there to the bottom? Here's a thought. The pool of Bethesda, there's an Oscalopian, which is a hospital um, attached to the god Oscalopius. If the guy goes and watches, washes at the pool of Bethesda, what might people say? It was Oscalopius that did this. And God won't share his glory. He won't. So he sends him to the Pool of Siloam. I stood there for the first time with an Israeli guide that said, and this is the Pool of Siloam where Jesus heals a blind man in John 9. Okay, let's go to the bus. And I was like, wait, whoa. <laughs> you don't just toss that out and walk away. <laughs> like what? We got to sit here and absorb that. So he goes to the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. And we know the rest of the story is that when he comes back, he makes a ruckus. And the temple officials, because he's like, man, I, all these people are like, oh my gosh, you can see. You, this is the guy that was blind and he could see. And we've seen him begging for years and he can see. And blah, blah, blah. Temple officials get a hold of this one and they're like, um... We're going to go ahead and not talk about that. Like, we know that this was a miracle, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. That's because they're Jewish. Um, and, but we don't want to talk about it. Like, you, you got to, 
And so they grill him, like, who did this to you? And he's like, I don't know. I was blind. <laughs> I, can't, I didn't even see him. <laughs> That's what he says. And they're like, well, wait a minute. This, who was it? Who did it? And he's like, I don't know. Do you guys, do you want to become his disciple too? And they're like, no, right? They, they blast him. Here's, here's the thing. What we want is not for God to do good to those who are good. What we want is for God to do good. But what we have to be careful of is to make sure that when God does good things, that we're willing to honor and praise Him and celebrate it. Rather than saying, God, your good things didn't fit into my mold, so I am unwilling to... Th like, they brought this guy's parents in. In John 9, they bring his parents in. They bring his parents in. And his parents go, listen, we don't want any part of this. He's old enough. His own parents won't support him. Because, so Jesus does a miracle, and all they can hold to is this doesn't fit into our religious system. I just want to offer Jesus isn't particularly motivated to uphold our religious system. Now, that doesn't make our religious system evil. What it means is we have to hold it with an open hand because God has permission to change it. He has permission to change it. Okay, last thing we want to talk about here briefly. It's an odd place for peace. How is he going to bring peace? Because remember, he talks about the do good to those who are good and for the evildoers, show them the back of your hand. Like, he just really, like, take care of business with the evildoers. How do we have peace? There's a couple of ways to do that. One is the elimination of the evildoers. The other is the elimination of fear. Here's the bottom line. Peace is rooted in internal work, not external factors. If I'm walking around anxious, fearful, unsettled, unsure, afraid, whatever label you want to put on it, insecure, if I'm in that space, the answer to that is not to change my external factors. The answer to that is to do the internal work. John 14, Jesus is in the Last Supper, and here's what he says to his guys. He's, getting, he's trying to get them prepared to be without him. And what he says is, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. Peace I leave with you. Jesus isn't leaving fear and concern and anxiety with them. Jesus is leaving with them peace. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I'm going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I'm going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. By the way, here's another way to understand what he's saying. I told you that I'm going away from you and, and, and I'm going to go to heaven. And if you really loved me, you'd be excited for me. But all you can think about is how freaked out you are for you. But I'm giving you a helper. Like you have the Holy Spirit for the purpose of helping you understand peace in the midst of difficult circumstances. So, God, there's good people and there's evil people. For the record, I do not get to decide which one is which. But God, do good to the good and to the evil take care of business. Who gets to decide who's evil and who's good? God does. 
My job is to have peace. Peace be to Israel. There's good and there's bad. There is these things in the world. My job is to have peace. We'll let God sort the rest out. Some implications for us. Implication number one. I cannot trust that God will do what I ask. I can trust that God will always act in my best interest. Like I'd love for us to just camp out on that statement for a while. We don't have time, but I cannot trust that God will always do what I ask. Now, that doesn't mean I shouldn't ask. You think about it this way. If you're a parent and your child comes to you and says, hey, um, could I have 20 bucks to go to the movie with my friends? Um, are you bothered that they ask? No, of course not. You don't care if they ask for the money. What gets a little bit tricky is if you say no, how do they act? Right? <laughs> you don't love me. <laughs> You're like, really? Because... I don't know that bed you were in at noon today, that seemed pretty comfortable. I mean, apparently, you really enjoy it because you're in it a lot. <laughs> that food you're eating, that shower you took, that big fat TV you watch all the time. You're worried about 20 bucks? This is what we do with God, right? We ask God for something and God says no, then we get all, God doesn't love me. We can't trust that God will always do what we ask. We can trust that God will always act in our best interest. We can trust that. So the no is always because of a more important yes that's coming. Implication number two. Our hearts are what God cares about. Shaming ourselves and others for poor actions can only reinforce brokenness in our lives. It's not about good and bad actions. It's about dealing with the stuff that's going on in our hearts. So you don't have to cut your right hand off. You don't have to gouge your eyes out. You don't have to do that. We have to deal with the stuff that's going on in our hearts that would keep us from doing the right thing in the first place. Implication number three. There will be wickedness on earth until Jesus' return. But evil doesn't get to have what God gives the righteous. What God gives the righteous is peace, calmness, security, hope, a future. These things matter way more than the size of our house or the kind of car we drive. God gives us purpose, a reason to get out of bed in the morning. Implication number four. Peace comes from my time with Jesus, not my circumstances. So if you're struggling with peace, like if you remember the fruit of the Spirit, we've, we've talked about this, right? The evidence that the Spirit is working in your life is love and joy and peace. Peace. So if you're lacking peace, the, the trick to having it is not go change your circumstances. The trick to having it is spend more time with Jesus so the Holy Spirit can work in your life. And peace is a byproduct of that. And the things that we used to get worked up with as we spend time with the Lord longer and longer and longer, the things that used to get us worked up don't get us worked up anymore. The things that used to knock us off our, off our path don't knock us off our path anymore. Because the Holy Spirit gives us peace. And there's so many places right now in our world where we're pointing to look at, like, that's messed up and that's messed up and that's messed up and it gives us anxiety. And I'm saying, yes, all of those things can be messed up and we don't ever have to lose our peace. Because our peace is a product of our relationship with Jesus, not a product of our circumstances. So as we enter into our communion time this morning, every week we take communion together. Uh, so you can start working on those wrappers because that takes a minute. But um, hold them. Hold your elements to the end and we'll take them together. But I'd love for you to wrestle with this question. Um, 
what's stealing your peace? And by proxy, what are you trying to make that say about God? Let's, let's meditate on that as we get our hearts ready for communion. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body which is given for you. So whenever you eat this bread, do it in remembrance of me. Let's remember him together. And then in the same way, after the dinner, he took a cup and he said, this cup, this is the blood of the covenant that was shed for you. So whenever you drink this cup, do it in remembrance of me. Let's pray. God, we love you and we trust you knowing that only you are the source of peace. And as the world shifts like sand, it feels like we're in a different landscape every day. And yet, God, your word still rings true. It's still constant. It's still secure. Help us to anchor to that in Jesus' name. Amen.